Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest in this edition is Harry Isabel Jr., a U.S. Army veteran of the Pacific Theater in World War II. And Harry, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure, believe me. Where were you born and raised, sir? I was born in Wheeling, West Virginia, June 27, 1925. Was there a history of military service in your family? Uh, no, no, there wasn't. No, no military in my family. I was the, I was the first. <laughs> what was your reaction to the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? You would have, would have been about 16 at that point. Well, I was, and it was terrible because I, was an, I graduated from a military school, Fork Union Military Academy in Fork Union, Virginia. So, of course, we were quite aware of uh, the hostilities because uh, of, the, of the military uh, training that we were undergoing at the time, and that influenced a lot of our thinking, of course, and uh, as soon as the war smacked on, brother, we were ready to go. Of course, at that time, I was a sophomore in high school, so uh, I had to abide my time till I graduated. But the big thing was, uh, as soon as I graduated, I, I told my, my dad, he says, what are you going to Because I was going to Penn State, which eventually I did graduate from. But uh, he says, what are you going to do for the summer? You're going to school in the fall. I said, no, 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 Daddy. I'm going to the service. He said, wait a minute, they'll draft you. I said, no, no, not me. I'm going to enlist. Well, he and my mother didn't like that, but I convinced them some way, and so I did. So why did you choose the Army? Well, as, as I said, I was in a military school, and all of our training was Army, and it was uh, pretty much dedicated kind of to infantry, and that's what I wanted because that's another thing. My father uh, said, uh, well, what, do, what, do you, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to go to the Army. He said, well, why don't you go to the Navy? It'll be nicer. And I said, I'm not looking for nice. I know the Army, and that's what I want to do. That's what I did. Where did you do your training? I did my training. Well, I was, uh, first of all, I was inducted into Fort Meade in Maryland. And after uh, a couple of weeks of this indoctrination and so forth there, we got on a train and went all the way to Camp Roberts, California, for my basic training in the infantry school. It was a 17-week program. And what unit did you end up getting assigned to? You mean when I went overseas? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, after the completion of the training in uh, at Camp Roberts, they sent us uh, up to Fort Ord, California, which is in the Carmel uh, area. And uh, then we uh, boarded the, uh, the ship and uh, went under the Golden Gate Bridge. I think the bridge at that time was uh, about seven years old. And we went to the Pacific and uh, landed into Pearl Harbor and went over to Schofield Barrack. And I met my division, which was the 27th Infantry Division, which is a great story in itself because... Uh, the divisions made up of three battalions, mine being the 165th Infantry, which in World War I they called the Fighting 69th. And this group of men had been together, quite a few of them, uh, because that uh, division was the New York National Guard. So all of a sudden I was an 18-year-old kid from little old Uniontown, Pennsylvania, thrown in with the guys from the Bronx and Brooklyn, and and uh, they were kind of streetwise guys, and they, they knew words that I never heard before. So uh, I, I joined my outfit right there at Schofield Barrack. You called them tough dudes in what I read, so that, that, that describes what you just mentioned pretty clearly. I'll tell you, it was really uh, funny, too, because uh, the Fighting 69th at that time, it was a big movie with uh, James Cagney and Pat O'Brien, and uh, it was a big-time movie, and they showed us the movie <laughs> when, because there was a lot of pride in the Fighting 69th. They had the big uh, armory in downtown New York, and uh, anyone from New York knows the Fighting 69th. So that was some outfit to get with, and... Uh, they, they, they were different guys, but pretty soon I was different, too. 
Well, your voyage into the Pacific was also notable for another reason, because that's when you learned about the D-Day landings at Normandy. Describe hearing that news and, and what your reaction and the reaction of the others was on the ship. Well, I'll tell you, you're 100% right. And, of course, uh, we all, you know, that was our thoughts were on Saipan because uh, prior to that, we didn't know we were going to Saipan, of course. No one knew where we were going. We just knew we were going into combat somewhere when we got on those ships. And uh, we are on the high seas for quite a few days, and then all the broadcasts came over on the ship about the landings in Europe, and everyone is jumping up and down. Hey, 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 this war is over. With you. These Japs, they can't carry the war effort, and we're going to beat those Germans in a couple of days, and let's turn this ship around. We don't have to go to war. But uh, the Japanese had a different idea of things, so uh, that, that was kind of a, a funny situation in a way, if it, if it can be called funny. But, uh, yeah, we, we learned about it on the high seas. Well, you got quite a few morale boosts on this voyage from uh, learning about your unit a little bit more detail and uh, knowing that the Allies had succeeded at Normandy. Uh, As you mentioned, Harry, you were headed to Saipan for what's called Operation Forager. Uh, What did you know about the overall plan or at least the part of the plan that involved your unit? Uh, Nothing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know... Saipan, what is Saipan? It's a little piece of seed in the in the water there, you know. Uh, when they mentioned the Marianas, you kind of had a little, we thought of uh, Guam was the big island in the Marianas, and that it, we'd have had been a protector or whatever of that island. But really, uh, I, I, it was, it was, it really wasn't seeded into my, into our memories. Uh, we just knew we were going to fight, and truthfully, all of my memories brought me back to things that I had heard about the wars in the Pacific when I was in school, for instance, like Guadalcanal, you know, and we read those stories about the uh, the island hopping and uh, the war and what it was like and so forth, and so therefore, I, I kind of knew what we were going to get into, but I didn't really know what we were going to get into until I got into it, if that answers your question. I, it was in my mind, but, uh, you know, you don't know. They had the maps, and we studied the maps, and uh, that was somewhat futile in a way because things change overnight. And the uh, the Japanese had the islands uh, for many, many million years, and they, they were quite prepared for everything the way they uh, had their caves dug and where they had them dug, and they came in and out of them with their artillery, and the way they planted the sugar cane to cover the, you know, everything. They had an awful lot of time to uh, prepare themselves. So really, uh, what we were getting into just came from what I knew about what happened previously, if you follow me. Absolutely. We're speaking with World War II U.S. Army veteran Harry Isabel Jr. And Harry, you've also talked about watching the naval bombardment of Saipan prior, obviously, to the amphibious landing. So what was going through your mind and and, and what was it like watching that bombardment, knowing you would soon be going ashore? Well, I can tell you one thing. I didn't think there would be one person left on that piece of dirt. I mean, you watch the bombardments and the airplanes and and they strafed and they bombed and our ships bombed and I thought, no way can anyone be alive. This will be nothing. We'll walk in there and we'll walk out the next day and it'll all be over. Of course, it was obviously much different, but uh, it's tremendous. I mean, the effort that we had and uh, our nation that we did, uh, it, it was it, it's unbelievable to watch and then land and face the people that we faced and fought them. It was uh, unbelievable. Before you could make a landing, of course, you had to get into the Higgins boats. And from what I understand, that was no easy task in and of itself. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I can tell you one thing. You're 100% right. You don't know. It's it, it's just something that it can't be explained. And we, of course, we didn't. That was one thing we didn't practice. I mean, we had no training in that. 
And uh, th- that night, of course, we knew we, we, what we were going to do because it was all explained to us and everything without the uh, actual uh, doing it. But um, when we were loaded down with uh, this and that, you know, they put a shovel on you so you can dig a foxhole if you if you have to and so forth, all of the training preparations, and you're kind of loaded down with the uh, items. And you get, uh, as I, I describe it to people, I say, look, just think you're going to climb out of the fifth-story window on a building and you're going to shimmy down the building itself. But just remember, the building is waving and you're going into a little boat that's in the bottom, which you can't see because, you know, you're kind of looking a little wee bit, but the, you, you do see it bobbling around, but you're so worried because there's a guy under you and there's a guy above you and you're loaded down and you're holding your rifle that you sure don't want to drop and uh, eventually uh, you get down the five stories and you're on the street and you're but you're in that boat and it's still bobbing and you get your place in there with about 50 other guys and you've made it hopefully and uh, then you take off in the uh, LCVP, which is a landing craft vehicle personnel, holds about 50 guys. Then we went on our way to, uh, and we rendezvoused for hours and hours, which was so laborious, I guess, to wait our time to go in, you understand. What got me was that diesel fuel. And I'm originally from near, near Pittsburgh, and I, for years and years and years, I just, couldn't get behind one of those diesel fueled buses because it brought back that memory of that terrible, terrible smell. So you're rendezvousing, you're rendezvousing, and finally uh, we started to go right in. Harry, let's pause right there. We'll be right back with much more of your story here on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus, and our guest is U.S. Army World War II veteran Harry Isabel Jr. Please stay with us. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks so much for being with us. Our guest in this edition is Harry Isabel Jr. He's a U.S. Army veteran in the Pacific Theater of World War II. He's a veteran of the Fighting 69th in the 27th U.S. Army Infantry Division. And uh, Harry, we're just in the middle of your story about uh, landing on Saipan, uh, the difficulty in getting into the Higgins boats and the waiting and the waiting and the diesel smell. So take us through the landing now. You mentioned that it took a lot longer than expected. Uh, explain why, and then explain how you got ashore. Of course, the, the landing, uh, none of them were simple, obviously, but we were supposed to go in, and the front of the Higgins boat is prepared to drop, and you run out, uh, run right out of the Higgins boat onto the, uh, onto the sand. However, all of a sudden, we were expected to go in, and this took a couple hundred yards from the beach, I would say, and uh, everything stopped. And the order came, okay, this is it, everyone over the side. You know, well, what is this, everyone over the side? Well, everyone over the side means everyone over the side. So I jumped out, and we all jumped out, and thank the good Lord, I felt uh, something under my feet. And I know uh, probably, and I do know that uh, uh, some people were as fortunate. However, when I hit the ground, I, well, I was one of the happiest guys in town, but I'm kind of overloaded with weight, and I just threw all that crap away. I'm calling it crap. I don't even know what it was. I know, as I said, they gave us a shovel. to, If I needed a foxhole, I'd dig it with my hands. That was my thought. And and I knew I'd need water, and I knew my ammo belt was on, and it was buckled to me, and I knew I'd need that. And certainly I didn't want my rifle to get wet, so I held that thing above my head and got as much off of me as I could and uh, pretty much just had water and uh, and my ammo and my rifle and myself and my steel helmet. Thank the good Lord for the steel helmet. And uh, I just waded in with the other guys, I guess, but we finally, uh, we made the beach. What did you see when you got to the beach? What was it like there? Well, it wasn't very comforting. I uh, I think uh, 
uh, probably that's the first time uh, outside of funeral homes when you went to visit it back home where you'd see uh, the people deceased and dead and, and all over. I mean, so many uh, Japanese, uh, they were just all over the place. And there was uh, some mortar fire, some artillery fire. There was no, uh, we didn't have any small arms fire because you see, the Marines uh, landed the day before, so uh, we didn't think that as to them, for them, we didn't have the uh, the beach fire to uh, contend with, but they were still capable of, uh, of some uh, mortar activity, and they still had their artillery because all of the bombing and everything that we did didn't knock them out immediately. You describe very clearly uh, early on, I don't know if it was your very first uh instance in combat, but it was certainly early on, when you saw an enemy in the trees, in the leaves, explain what you were thinking and, and, and what happened next. Well, I, yes, I did. And I, uh, it's explainable, but it's hard to de- just to figure out. Uh, I mean, I saw this guy and we, he was like, you know, real close to me, maybe 20 yards away. And of course he was a Japanese soldier and I can still see his face. And I just had a feeling, and I still do, that there were only two people on this earth, he and I. And I had a rifle at my hip, and I just fired away, and I had the M1 holds eight uh, eight rounds in the clip. And I fired all eight of them, and then the the, uh, the M1 throws the clip out itself, and then you reload, which I did. And I fired 16 shots. That's inhuman. It, it happened, that's the best I can tell you. What were you thinking after that? Well, I was just thinking, let's go, keep going, keep going, because, you know, uh, I uh, all wars are uh, the same, but all wars are different. And, you know, I wasn't in Europe, but uh, Europe and uh, the Pacific are two different wars, basically, because you know, you're talking uh, Europe pretty much uh, expansive territories. But when you're talking the Pacific, you're talking a lot of pieces, little pieces of dirt there. You've got hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of guys trying to stay alive and and put the other guy down. And so there's not much room in between. So you just keep moving and moving and hoping you're not the next guy. Harry, let's pause one more time. When we come back, we'll have the rest of your story. Here on Veterans Chronicles, I'm Greg Columbus, and our guest in this edition is Harry Isabel Jr., a U.S. Army veteran of the Pacific Theater of World War II. Please stay with us. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest in this edition is Harry Isabel Jr. He's a U.S. Army veteran of the Pacific Theater in World War II. In the previous segment, uh, Harry described his landing at Saipan and his first one-on-one interaction uh, with Japanese forces. But, of course, there are other moments during the Battle of Saipan that we want to get to, and Harry, you have said uh, in your written history that the hardest thing about your service was seeing the young men who were killed and wounded. How were you and the others able to stay focused in what is obviously a very difficult situation? Obviously, there's so much sadness because even though you hadn't been together too long, you became quick friends, and the uh, the action makes uh, everyone, uh, let's say, blood brothers. And to see a guy get down right next to you who had been your friend, and it's a happening. And but the thing about it is, you're there for a purpose, and you just have to keep keep rolling, keep rolling, and just keep going. And and that's what we did. And Harry, uh, obviously, the United States military uh, shows great respect uh, to the fallen. The vast majority of the time, you tell a story of you and a fellow soldier coming across a fallen American, and then you and that fellow soldier got into a pretty heated argument. Tell me about that one. Well, we did, and I didn't like it. And uh, this guy was a New York guy, older. I was a kid. I was 18. I was the youngest one. They called me Junior. But this guy came over, one of our poor guys was killed. And the guy went right over to him, and he just, took the wristwatch off of the, our fellow soldiers, their dead fellow soldiers' wrist, and I, 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 it just hit me, and I says, what in the world, what, don't, what, he put that back on his wrist. He said, I always like that watch. 
much. He won't need it anymore. And I said, I was thinking of the poor guy's mother. And I said, well, his mother would want that watch. And the guy just looked me right in the eyes. He said, shut up, Isabella, or I'll blow your head off. Wow. That was it. And as I said, people are people. And, you know, when you throw a bunch of guys together, and uh, I think I think the actions the, the must, obviously must do something to people, too. And they, they just lose the respect for many things. You know, we lost a lot of guys. and. You know, in different times, we'd have to, we'd go back and find our guys because some of them would be there. And uh, sadly, I can still see in my mind some of the guys. I I saw one poor guy is there, and he'd been there overnight. And I don't know if it was the uh, the Japanese that uh, that were merciful that, that that tore him apart or whatever, but I, to my day, I can all, the only thing I can see is that poor guy with his rosary beads on. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's those things that you, I never talked about these things. No, no, no one ever knows, knew about my activities. I, 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 until very recently. We're speaking with U.S. Army veteran Harry Isabel Jr., a veteran of the Pacific Theater of World War II, and, uh, Harry, another very difficult day for you was June 24th, 1944, when your position came under attack from Japanese mortars and machine guns. You were able to hide effectively from those, but then your superior um, had a special request of you. Tell us about that. Oh, yes. Okay, well, we were on the move. Of course, we were always on the move, and as I said, uh, things were close. Everyone was fairly close generally to each other and 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 I heard the the uh, machine gun and and then I heard these screams and I had a little protected area that I was in behind I, I can still see it it was a big, for some reason I found a big pile of rocks and I'm kind of waiting there to make my move and all of a sudden I hear this voice and I knew the voice was our company commander and he said is that you Isabel and I said, yes, sir. And, and I, you know, this is hard to believe that this conversation could go on, but it was very short. And quickly he said, how old are you, Isabel? I said, 18, sir. I'll be 19 in a few days, which I was. He says, well, I hope you make it. He says, you hear that? And I said, I sure do. It was terrible to scream. He said, that's so-and-so and so-and-so. And and if you're with me, you and I are going up there and get them off and get them some help. And I said, let's go. And we did. And we moved up some way. I don't know. It's in my mind, how in the world did we do? What we do? What we do? I don't know. But we got there. Possibly we neutralized their machine gun by that time, or they were shooting at someone else. Or I, I have no idea. But we got there, and some of the poor guys were gone. But the couple of them that we were able to move over to the uh, to our medic. A little bit later, Harry, your captain had a surprise for you in connection uh, to that day. You were awarded a bronze star for your actions. Uh, what was yeah. that what was that moment like? Well that was something. Uh, one of the guys said, Hey Isabel, the captain wants to see you. What'd you do now? And I said, Oh gee. So he called me in. He said, uh, Isabel, he said, we're having an award ceremony. Tomorrow there's a parade, and you're going to be awarded the Bronze Star. And I said, what? I didn't even know what the Bronze Star was. I said, for what? And well, he got a little upset at me. For what you did out there, you know what you did. I said, I don't know what I did. So anyway, we got that solved. And then he said, what burns me up is, he said, I put... I nominated you for the Silver Star, but the review board reduced it to the bronze, which I didn't really care. But in later years, it kind of burned me up with some guy sitting at a desk decides I should get a bronze. Ver- and I'm, had, I'm not, not, believe me, I'm not saying this because I think I deserve I it ha- you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, you think your captain's evaluation is probably a little more accurate than the guy at the desk. Yeah, I would think so, and it's really, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, so, but uh, the only thing is, if I had the silver, I could certainly be buried at uh, Arlington, and the bronze I can. So, anyway, that's the deal. 
One of the other things that you write about, Harry, is how tense things were on the Night Watch during the Battle of Saipan. Tell me about that, please. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, you know, you took your turn. You had to stop sometime, get a little rest during the day. And, and of course, no one really rested. I think uh, it was a month pretty much without any sleep. It may be a little wee bit every once in a while, but... Uh, yeah, you'd have guys that uh, they'd be on watch, and you know some guys were different than others, and and <laughs> some guys always saw something, or, or they'd either lob some grenades or shoot, and they say, "What are you doing? There's someone out there. There's someone out there." Well, well, thank goodness most of the time there wasn't, but they were being cautious, and so that that just happened. You have called the Japanese crazed soldiers led by deranged officers. Uh, talk a little more about that. Well, that's pretty much an opinion of mine. I mean, these uh, uh, these guys knew it was over, obviously, but uh, they were a crazed group of people, and they'd, they'd run around like, uh, I don't know. That, that, that was pretty much an opinion of mine that they... That they, they they were tenuous people. I mean, they they did they, they. There was no give up to them. They uh, like they signed the pledge that we're going down. You know, although I do know uh, we didn't personally take any prisoners, but I can see different times would we be there that a truck would go by with a a, a group of uh, prisoners that they gave up somewhere on the island and they brought them by in the trucks and they were kind of a jovial group of people but uh, i think most of them were they, they were there to die for the emperor what else do you remember about the combat there i i just remember how important certain things are uh flamethrowers for instance i never saw I mean, we did we did when i was in basic training and so forth we we didn't do anything with the flamethrowers and uh, the power of the flamethrowers was tremendous and the way that we uh, flushed those guys out of those caves uh, because you know they, they'd go in those they had those caves everything was fortified so well that they had their little homes in there but we we got them out of there pretty quick what did you do after the battle after the battle oh man it was lovely we just camped around the water and we uh, we didn't do anything. We just loafed around, and the water was beautiful, and swam. And uh, there were a few guys from my old hometown that we some way got together, and it was uh, everything was neat. But then we uh, finally left there, and we went to um, to uh, New Hebrides, across the equator, which. That's another chore. We cross the equator. Of course, when you cross the equator, there's a big ceremony where the guys that already been there, they take advantage of you, and they shave your head, and you become a, I think it was a polywog, they called it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we went to, uh, to a New Hebrides. And is that where you were when the war ended? No, no. I, when the war ended, I was in the States. What was your reaction when you heard the war was over? Well, I'll tell you what, the reaction, I was, when the war was over, I was in uh, halfway finished with the Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. But when you finished at that time, you finished uh, the OCS school, I would have had to sign up for a year to stay in the Army. And believe me, I didn't want to do that. I was finished. I mean... Saipan finished me uh, as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, and so I resigned. And oh man, that that was a big a, a big thing. I mean, they talked, tried to talk me out of that, talk me out of it. No one resigns from OCS school, and I said, well, here's one guy that does. <laughs> I, I said, I, I'm I'm going. I, I want to go home. I'm out of here. What did you do after the war? Okay, after the war, I uh, went to Penn State, and I graduated from Penn State, and uh, Dorothy and I, my dear wife, who's right here with me, uh, we got married, and we had four wonderful daughters, and we've had a great life, 
we were married. We're going to be married in September 71 years. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you so much. In June, I'll be 97, and in July, Dorothy will be 93. Fantastic. Congratulations on all of those celebrations. I hope they are all wonderful. Um, as, as you know, Harry, many veterans did not want to share their stories for many years after the war. Uh, what about you? Was it difficult to start sharing what you had experienced? Uh, yes, in a way it was, and I'll tell you how this started. Uh, I, as I said, I graduated from Penn State. And uh, oh, maybe four or five years ago, uh, one of my fraternity brothers passed away, and in his will, he left twenty-five thousand dollars to build a memorial for World War II guys on the lawn of my fraternity house at Penn State. So, myself, uh, when I found out about this, I got a little bit involved because uh, I haven't been too much involved and fraternity life for years, although I loved it when I was there. So I kind of got involved uh, to make sure that the guys that I knew were in the war were were on this, uh, the names were on the plaque, you see. So in my fraternity, there were about 100 guys in World War II. Now out of that group, I knew about 60 because some were older, you know, not many younger, but a lot of them were older and graduated before myself. So one of the guys in this kind of uh, spearheaded the thing, and uh, I contacted him, and then he, he was a retired Army colonel, and he was really, uh, really an Army guy. And so we talked about my experiences, and he asked me, this question and that, and I kind of put together a little bit and gave it to him. And out of these fraternity guys, as I said, they're under, there are two of us living today. The other gentleman is 101. He's in a nursing home in Pennsylvania somewhere, and here am I. So that's how I started this. And then when I put all that together, and then my children were... They, saw what was going on, they said, well, why don't you just write this thing up and we'll we'll do it. And so my daughter and son-in-law took all of my notes with myself, and we put my little story together, which was given to you. So that's how this really all started. But I will say that about five years ago, I started to wear my World War II hat. And I'm really happy I did, not for recognition by anyone. But people come up to me, and it's so nice that they, because their father or <laughs> grandfathers were in the war and so forth, and it brings on some conversation. And I think it benefits them as much as myself. And then I get to talk to a lot of Vietnam guys that, that I like to talk to, and they like to talk to a WW2 guy. And I don't have to tell you that uh, the line is growing thinner. So, Indeed. Uh, last question, Mr. Isabel. It's been a fascinating conversation, and we're so glad that you preserved your story, and we're, we're glad to have it here as part of Veterans Chronicles. What are you most proud of from your time in service to our country? Well, that's a pretty broad question, but... Uh, I, I, it, it, I, I don't think I can pinpoint one thing, but I am really so proud that I had the opportunity to do service for my country. You know, so many people would demean the service and demean what happens, and I'm not in favor of war. Obviously, I'm not. We'd certainly be better off without it. But I think this is our country, and if need be, we fight for our country. Well said, sir. Thank you very, very much for your service to our country. And thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. We truly appreciate it. Well, Greg, thank you so much uh, for giving me that opportunity. And I appreciate it. Your questions were right on the money. And I hope my answers were close. Oh, absolutely fascinating conversation. Harry Isabel Jr., a U.S. Army veteran of the Pacific Theater, of World War II. I'm Greg Columbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, 
Hi, this is Greg Columbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook, and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.